So we're back for part two of this interview series with Eric Rydberg, and we're speaking about compression and gear used and plugins and recording philosophies that was used to record Twilight's Cold. Now, if you missed the first episode, it was all about the gear, the guitars, and, you know, uh, an overview of the whole studio. And this one, we're going to talk about a little bit about techniques and things like that. Just thinking that you're going to do a tip and trick and just throw this plug in on your master bus and wow, it's going to sound great. No, because you missed the whole philosophy on how to use this stuff. So when you told the story about, um, you know, the R&T making you the ability to hear a little, you know, whether a fingernail is, you know, a little rough or whatever, that reminds me back to the day when we first met when I introduced you to Focal Professional. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember the first time I plugged in these Focals, and I forget which guitarist I was listening to. He's a classical guitarist, and I could actually tell, no kidding, his ring finger on his picking finger had a misshapen nail just just purely out of the the, the detail of the sound that was coming out of these things it, it utterly boggled my mind i'd never heard anything as detailed as those so and obviously when i come down to your studio and i see all the different products that you have not even necessarily from the focal line most of it's uh, Focal, like your Sopras, which are spectacular <laughs> right. pieces of audio bliss. Um, it, it's it's a as a consumer to music, you just want something that sounds good. I don't know how else to describe that. As a creator of music, you have a critical ear, right? It's almost incumbent upon people that make music, that mix engineer music. That you're, you have to turn that switch off to enjoy music. At, at least that's my experience, right? Right, right. Like with my album, I know when I am at the point now where I'm ready to say, okay, we're, we're close to being done and mixed here because I can listen to my own music and go, okay, I'm, I'm tapping my foot. I'm not listening to the bass line or the guitar line or the, the ratio between this level and that level kind of thing. Uh, having the ability to have critical listening is incumbent a person who's creating the music and those kinds of tools are what you need but it's not just that right and that was the other part when you saw me those vocals was all the acoustic treatments yeah because why spend all that money on good monitors if you can't hear what's going on in the room yeah you could take the best monitor yeah. or mic in the world and if you put it in a bathroom or a gymnasium it's going to sound like it's in a bathroom or a gymnasium exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so and I'm, I'm very happy with the response I've gotten to this, the, the folks at Vicoustics that built this layout of these treatments, which if you kind of look at this room, it's pretty much plastered with acoustic treatment. There is an, There are very few parts of this room that don't have acoustic treatments in there. Um, but the end result is when I put a reference mic right here at the listening position, I basically got a flat response in the room. A little well, bit of a bump. But. And the thing that was interesting about your build is, you know, one third of your area has windows on it. And so, you know, they make these great rooms that are free, you know, freestanding units that were able to block out the windows, be bass traps. Uh, they actually morph around and allow you to have reflective side or absorptive side, you know. Um, it just really worked out for, for the situation you're in because you can't glue a bass trap into the corner right. of your room, you know. Yeah, those, those standing bass traps that they make uh, from Vicoustics are, are awesome. Uh, I'm I'm absolutely pleased with the stuff I got here, both in looks, which was more important to the other side of the equation than function, which is the most important to me. Uh, and here, I say that tongue in cheek, but yeah, they worked out well. Yeah, and then you know after we did the acoustics and we did the focals, um, since I have a full commercial studio and I do teaching and stuff like that, you actually started you know become an apprentice, if you will, and and uh, we started talking about the art art and science of recording um you know i think at you were starting to understand that yeah gear is very helpful i mean those focals blew your mind and opened up a new world for you mm -hmm. but you also were you know i'll say smart enough or, or you you knew that it's more about knowledge it's not necessarily about the equipment it's about knowledge 
and over time we've we've developed a relationship and and getting that knowledge into you to where you're not sitting there saying hey Jim what compressor I should I should buy it's hey Jim I think I need a compressor right. because I want to do this and this am I in the right ballpark or you know what should I be looking at so when you and I talked the other day I had mentioned that I did a lot of my learning by trial and error in sound engineering space I've been playing guitar for 40, 50 years now, right? So, 46 years. So, I've done the, the playing stuff. The engineering stuff is is more recent for me. But I didn't do the YouTube thing. I spent a lot of time learning by trial and error as to what sounded good or what didn't sound good. Uh, so, when I finally got to the point where I decided I need to expand beyond the horizons of just the stock plugins that I can get out of the DAW... Uh, is when I approached you and said, dude, I, I think I need to get a, a compressor. I think, I think I'm ready to start getting into the hardware piece of this, which was completely, I remember that first discussion. Your first question to me was, so what's your goal here? What do you want to do in your setup? And I went, everything in the box. All the DAW, I don't want any off-board stuff, which would change how things got set up. After all of that trial and error, when I decided I finally wanted to get some compression stuff, uh, that, that accelerated the learning because seeing what compression does, so I, I don't think I ever told you this, but what I, what I did to teach myself the, uh, the, the basics of what compression does, and this actually happened more with the distressors than it did with the, the iron, was I take a track and look at the actual uh, the, the waveform yeah, the wave in the track, and then I would take... For example, in a stressor, and I'd run an input of five and attack a zero, uh, release a five, and I'll put a five, run it, print it, look at it side by side with the track that I just compressed and see what the changes were and then start changing the attack knob, right? And seeing what that what, what happened to that signal because it, you and I talked about this before. You take a compressed track, you put it into the entire mix, you may or may not hear the effects of the compression. If you do the compression right, you probably won't hear the effects of the compression because right. it'll fit in better, right? Right. So the, the, the learning chunks, the blocks, happened in that iterative process of seeing by turning a knob, you know, big knob turn, uh, big knob turns and seeing what happens on the waveform. Uh, you can read that in any textbook, but doing that for yourself and having control over those changes at least for me was a was a huge thing right well and the thing that's kind of interesting when you say textbook is there's a lot of you know the handbook of recording or whatever these <laughs> titles are out there and a lot of them are like this is what an equalizer is this is what a compressor is they don't really teach you anything right. they just kind of give you a definition and that doesn't really do much for you um, and then you go to youtube and you got the youtubers which you know hey bless them that they're successful uh but Tips and tricks, that's not teaching you anything anyways. That's like, it just, it doesn't make sense because you don't have the knowledge to truly understand the compressor, which I think is the hardest thing to understand. Um, and these tips and tricks, is, it's, it's a trick, honestly. You know, they're, they're not telling you anything uh, where once you know the art and science of recording, it's not a tip or trick anymore. It's just knowledge that you understand. And... You know, one of the things I'll say is I was watching um, uh, Chris Alert Algae today on a video because he has all these wave plugins. And his plugins now are kind of this like amalgam of what he has in the real world. So he might have five things on his master bus, but now it's a plugin with like three faders. And you could just do this or do that. What I've noticed is there's philosophies in how you actually record. So, for instance, if you have nothing on your master bus and you make this incredible mix and you take one of those, you know, mix from Chris Lord Algae and you throw it on there, it usually, to my ears, doesn't sound good. Even though it's set up at the right levels and all it just doesn't sound good because we have this pristine mix already sounding awesome. And then you put this compressor on it, it just kind of sounds like wet cardboard or destroys the mix or whatever. But that's not how Chris Lord Algae works. He works with that on his bus to start with, and he works into it. Right. And so he's compensating doing, I mean, if you see him do some EQs, he's like 15 dB at AK, and he's doing right. this and he's doing that. And what's happening is it's hitting into that compressor, and it's doing a certain thing. Right. So just thinking that you're going to 
do a tip and trick and just throw this plug in on your master bus and wow, it's going to sound great. No, because you miss the whole philosophy on how to use this stuff. And that's one of the things like um, I have the, uh, the Studio Edge recording tutorial series which came out a while ago and I'm repurposing it right now. And I'm teaching you the art and science of recording. I'm not saying this is how you EQ a snare drum. This is how you EQ anything you want to EQ. And I used to have people call my studio all the time and say, hey, Jim, um, so when I bring my guitar rig in, what microphone are you going to use on it? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know what your guitar rig sounds like. And so it just, like, if it's trebly, I'm going to use a ribbon mic. If it's, you know, super, you know, dirty and not much high end, I might use a condenser mic on it or, you know, whatever. There's not just one thing that, you know, works with everything. And I think when you learn the physics and the science and the acoustics of the room and you start understanding where that mic gets placed and stuff like that, you're talking about philosophies and you're talking about physics and now you're working with physics. And so it's funny to hear your story about the distressor because scientifically went in in an extreme way and looked at the visuals. And most people can say, hey, don't look at the screen. Use your ears. But that's what you needed you to, connect the to dots. learn. Right. And, you know, just like you have touch screens and other people, they don't need touch screens. They're, they're just visual or whatever. You need to do what you need to do to get to the point where you are knowledge-wise and then go apply it within the philosophy. So two things to that. First, I've never told you this, but before I actually called you for the first time, I'd actually already watched all of your Studio Edge Studio Oh, that's Edge amazing. Videos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had already consumed all the stuff before I gave you a call. The second thing is uh, that that back and forth with the waveforms on the, on the screen with the distressor stuff – what that bought for me, it, it is very elementary, right? It is, some people would say that's probably the wrong way to do it. But in doing it that way and seeing the the effects of this much of a knob swing versus this much of a knob sure. swing on the, on the waveform and then listening to it with these things and hearing how grungy it can get, you know, especially when you start throwing the distortion, or the distortion oh, right. settings in there, that actually took me to a spot where I learned something that it's not just basic compression because the, the distressor is not just a compressor. Right? right. And on this last album, almost all of my bass tracks that have grunge on them, of that dirt, that fuzz on them, is from a distressor. Right. right. From a distressor three through them, crunching the shit out of them, but throwing, throwing them through uh, distortion three. So that took me to a spot where I could actually take that knowledge and now use this piece of equipment the way it was intended to be used because I understood the, the what the knob swings do for you uh, and then, you know, be able to apply some of the other attributes to it, which are extremely powerful, right? I mean, I'll say it again. This is this is a this is a basic tool that every studio that want, is serious about making music. Is, no, absolutely. They're very powerful things. Yeah, I mean, everything that Empirical Labs makes and, uh, and, and just so people know, I'm actually a dealer of Empirical Labs Empirical Labs, I just don't have it on my website, but all my installs, that's what I'm putting in. I'm putting in distressors. I just recently tried out the Mic E, and that has kind of like a distressor built into it. Mm -hmm. And even though you could put the 80 hertz uh, roll off on that thing, it is still meaty and chunky. And every review you read online, everybody's like, man, this is the most amazing mic pre. And the people that sold them, like, I wish I would have never sold that. I want to buy it back. Like, they just make really, really good stuff. So speaking of Empirical Labs, on this last album, the reason I bought, so I got deep into the UAD plug-in space, which I hadn't done before because I didn't have UAD hardware. Right. So I went out and got uh, one of the Octo Pre's that would allow me to throw uh, several several different kinds of UA plugins on this last album I was working on. And the Fatso was the point of that comment. Uh so I wasn't looking for large swings in sound. I was trying to get that caramel color. I think in colors when I think about sounds, right? And getting that more brownish caramel color in my lead solo guitars. I ran all of my lead solo, gu solo guitars through that Fatso okay. plugin. Uh, and it was just this nice, nice, it's hard to describe in words, uh, a nice... Took the edge off, right? It was as smooth as one of the adjectives I'd use, but it was more than that. It, it was just this warm, 
with this warmth smoothie thing that that in my to me to my ears made it sound really good. And I knew that walking into because I've been eyeballing a fatso. You and I talked about this for a while, right? Uh, about getting a fatso and and the empirical labs whole line of equipment. I've been very happy with all the stuff that I've dealt with. Absolutely, distressor and a fatso. Um, really, really good, really good equipment. Well, and tell us a little bit about the iron. How you use the iron, man? So this was actually. So when you talk about when I first approach you about getting hardware, this was the first compressor I bought. So I kind of leapfrog through, I don't know how many different kinds of compression into <laughs> mastering compressor with this one fairly substantial uh, purchase. The, the, when you and I had this discussion, I, I approached you and said, Jim, I need a compressor. And you said, okay, what, what do you want to do with it? You know, there's... The different flavors you got your fats you got your optic opto you know take your pick stuff distressors the uh um the swiss army knife of uh compression and i had focused because i had been to your studio after you had mastered a couple i think it was my first album or my second it was my first album and when you were mastering i saw you using the spl iron and uh, I started asking questions about that and trying to understand the very new kind of mm -hmm. approach that they have in there which for the person who doesn't understand what that means, that's just magic, right? It's just magic right. in the box that gazentas and the gazadas and what comes out is pretty damn good. Um, your comment to me was, this is basically going to be a catch-all for everything, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you have to work hard to screw up a sound with an iron. That's right. really what it boils down to. You could, you, know, you can run these things down to the limit and squash the snot out of them, and it's still going to sound pretty damn good. Yeah. Right? Not that I've ever done that, but uh, mostly this is just a bus compression kind of thing for me. But uh, it's an amazing tool that not nearly as quantifiable as a distressor, right? I can't take the SPL iron, turn the knob, look at, you know, t you know put the setting at 14 with uh, the germanium rectifier, run it through, compress it, and print it and see what it looks like, and then turn the knob to 40 and see what happens. It's not nearly as clear cut of a change as what you get out of a distress when you do right, that, right? right because of the way they do their compression in this thing right there's so many different uh, uh, modes from germanium to LED you know all these different versions and you have different time time constant which yep. is very fair childish right you have yep. one two three four five six yeah, yeah. and what's the magic behind those the one thing that really kind of threw me for a loop when I first got this, because I, I vividly remember talking to you about this, and I basically just kind of did the, so what are you using? <laughs> right. right. What, you, what settings are you using, which is mostly mastery stuff. So you're down in the, you know, 12 to 14 kind of threshold, depending on the content, obviously, with slower attacks. And you were always using the, the two, I think it was the setting number two in the germanium on your rectifier. Whatever it was, the point was, sure. you, know, you can look through the manual and see that the farther right you turn the knob, the quicker the stuff is. The farther left the knob goes, it's it's a little bit looser on its attack. Uh, but I kind of struggle with, okay, so now I've got different material. I've got classical stuff. I've got rock stuff. I've got stuff that was in my last album. Where am I going to turn all these knobs? And kind of what I found out was, which is basically what you told me was, find a setting that you dig and start with that, right? And most of the time, you're going to dig it anyway, so don't bother, you know, messing with all the knobs. So what's funny about this is I was actually at a party with, like, 40 engineers and the owner, uh, Herman, from SPL, who designed this unit, and me and him got into a conversation. And the next thing you know, me and him, like, split off from the whole crowd. And we're in a whole separate room, sitting on a couch with our drinks, and we sat there for something like four or six hours straight, just talking about engineering and everything to do. And I would say half of that conversation was this unit. And and I'm like, well, you know, I'm having a hard time understanding this and this. And I don't understand, you know, and I'm going, you know, through all this stuff. And he goes, well, when I do it, I just turn knobs until it sounds good. <laughs> and I'm sitting there scientifically like, well, it's only at five milliseconds. And then, it, you know, and he's like, now I understand. <laughs> Dude, I, I literally have kept the settings almost identical for the last five years I've had this thing. Right? Wow. It, it, and the only thing that changes is the threshold knob based right. on, the, on the program material, right? Right. Uh, it, but to your point, to his point, is 
what comes out of the end result when you run it through this is that warm glow that that people call it glue take your pick of what you want to call it 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 does not sound like something that you threw out of out of your bedroom right the thing that i really like about this too is like you know if you're mastering let's say you have a, a song that starts out in low volume and it gets to a high volume right mm -hmm. and you go through all your mastering stuff and compression compression is only going to kick in after this threshold mm -hmm. And then you're going to peak eliminate. And so what you got is all this peak information here. And then you can see it's all been ripped off. When you put it through here. It doesn't do that. All the stuff at low volume doesn't have those peaks either. And so it di it's almost like, like an envelope modifier, right? I don't know how it's doing it. In fact, Herman talked about all this stuff. <laughs> like I got a double E degree. But, but what he was saying was just like. Okay, like I got the point of it, but I can't regurgitate it, right? Like, it's so it was really funny. But this thing does some magic that I've always looked for when I was mastering, and I I had to have it. I I wouldn't do without it. I, like I said, dude, the only time this thing comes out of the tool, the only time this thing gets powered on is when I'm at that latter stage of a mix where I go, okay, we're getting close to being done here. When I start putting the polish on with this thing, I have the plug in obviously, which works pretty good. Mm -hmm. I have. Plug into the hardware. They say it works equivalently as well. I think I said previously that for some reason I feel like this gives me a better sound, and maybe that's just because I'm actually putting it through something with tubes. But um, well, the other thing that people have to realize is, you know, if you just take a mic pre and you put stuff straight in the box and you do everything in the box, it's fair game. You're allowed to do that. However. The amount of signal to noise ratio and stuff and, you know, the amount of, we'll say, algorithm crunching that's going on in your computer, you're doing a lot to the sound in the digital domain that you could be doing outside before you hit the A to D converters. And what that does is a few things. It gives you better signal to noise ratio. It gets you better, I'll say, meat, if you will, into the box at a decent volume. And you have better headroom now. And you're 90% close to the final sound that you're going to have before it even meets the A to D converter. And so for me, you know, like my specialty is drums, right? And I'm a drummer myself. I actually don't compress my drums on the way in. Why? Because I'm behind the drum kit and I can't be at the engineering controls and behind the drum kit at the right. same time. Right. And I'm scared that I'm going to bake something in that is really bad. But besides that, when it comes to everything else, bass, acoustic guitar, all, you know, electric guitar, I leave alone, vocals, you name it, it's compression on the way in. Now, I don't have to do a lot of EQ on the way in because using my knowledge with acoustics and placement and the right microphones over the years that I've collected, I set up stuff and I'm 95% of the way in without manipulating stuff. It's, it's really good. All I'm doing is compression, mic pre, mic selection, acoustics we're good. But, you know, the stuff that you don't want to mess up is over compressing electric guitar and over compressing a drum and ripping something off accidentally. Now, if it was another drummer in the studio and I was engineering, well, it's fair game. I could do whatever I want. But since I don't do it all the time because I'm usually drumming, I just, I stay safe. But it, there's something to be said about having color before the ADD goes in, color of your choice. You know, I have pristine preamps, I have tube preamps, I have the vintage 610 UA preamps that definitely gives us older sound. Um, and I get those choices on the way in, and then once I'm in, then I can do whatever I want in the box, but I'm 90% I'm of the way there. When it comes to preamps, I am tickled with that Shelford channel. I am very happy with that. That was a really good purchase. My, my, only, my only gripe is I'd like to have more than one of them. Uh, yeah, I noticed I showed you the picture the other day, and there was like four of them in a row. And you're like, that's four of them? <laughs> you're like freaking out like, wow, I want that. <laughs> it's, just, it's just such a great tool. I mean, I, I want, so a lot of times I'll DI my bass into the box uh, for when I'm tracking that. I've got some, you know, some good UA plugins in the bass discussion that uh, you and I have had previously about getting the, great, the right bass sound. But the DI through that shelfer channel is awesome. It, mm -hmm. it, I, that is just that, that's a great tool to have in the studio for the Gazentas kind of stuff ADL 600 is really nice as well but I am 
really happy with the amount of control I have over that uh, over the sound through that shelf channel. channel. It's really nice. I meant to tell you this while you're talking about drums. I, I don't really compress any of your drums when I'm mixing them. Maybe the kick, very lightly the snare, and that's it. I don't compress anything else. And you know what? I don't really either. Um, I, a little bit of kick, a little bit of snare. Um, people would think, you know, because I'm kind of known for my drum sounds, people would think like, oh, he's just, you know, doing all this stuff and the room mics and doing all this stuff. It's like, uh-uh. You know what it is? Good sounding drums <laughs> yeah. and a good room with good <laughs> microphones yeah. and awesome pre's. That's what it is, you know? Last time when he didn't like the heads that were on your toms and you were, that was a painful, painful back and forth trying to figure out where that sound was. Yeah, so what's funny about this is you know, I've been recording my drums for whatever, 15 years, you know, that particular drum set and everything. And uh, I would hand these tracks off that I'd do for Eric, and he'd be mixing them, and I'm like, what did you do to it? <laughs> what did you do to my drum sound? I'm doing anything. I'm like, all you have to do is put the faders up, put some reverb on it. Like, what, what are you doing? And I think, you know, with this last album that you've worked on, you've done a really good job at, uh, you know, getting them, um, a lot closer, even actually even further than I would take it in the sense of processing and reverb and that big, huge rock sound mm -hmm. um, instead of just a natural sound. Yep. Uh, and, and I think part of that is you get to play with all day long where I'm always on the clock with clients. And so I can't play with the food so much. I'm under I'm under under a budget. Right. right. Um, but talking about drum sounds is kind of funny. In my tutorial series, uh, I have the one that's the the anatomy of drums. And then the next course after it is called, uh, you know, like microphone placement. And then the last one is a little bit of mixing. And so I get to the first chapter of the microphone placement and, and I, I kind of jokingly say, so you're probably wondering, Jim, when are we going to get to actually getting some great drum sounds? And it's like, well, if you missed it, it was in the last 40 chapters about drums. <laughs> it's not about the miking technique. It's not about the mixing. It's about the drums and the heads and the, you know, the tension on the heads. And, you know, that's where all this comes from. So people got to remember it's it's about good instruments and, and playing, great playing. And So you your mic setup, though, and your drums is not nearly as complex as a lot of other folks that mic up their drums, right? When you, get, you start dealing with your phase issues on the mics... Uh, on opposing uh, mics and that kind of stuff. You don't do that on your side. No, and it's kind of funny um, because there's, like, I remember, I don't I remember who the engineer's name is, but it was a, it was a newer Rush album, uh, maybe in the last three albums or something like that. And this guy's, you know, Neil has this huge kit, right? Just huge. And he was doing top and bottom tom mics. Mm -hmm. Now, it might be the Holy Grail sound. I don't know. I've never heard it, you know, like sold or whatever. Um, but I'm just like, you got 40, 50 mics on a drum kit? Like the logistics of that is like, if, uh, it's just too much, man. I, I I don't I'm not gonna have 40, 50 tracks, and even if he's you know summing those to a cable and going you know one's out of phase and summing them and putting it, that's still just a that's a lot it's of a work. Lot of stuff to deal with. And I just don't feel I have to do that to get great sounds. You know, the one tool that I have found that at least in this last album that worked out well for me was. Native Instruments has this Transient Master. It's a real simple plug-in that you can slap onto every single track you have in your drum kit. You pretty much look at all the tracks I have right now uh, on this kit, and I've got that Transient Master on a good chunk of at oh, least yeah. all the toms mm -hmm. because you can really accentuate the belly on the tom sound with that plug-in. That a lot, and it doesn't require that much more than just throw the plug-in in. Yep. A little tweak. Turn, do a little bit of tweak and you're good. You're golden, right? So, Other than panning, it's a little bit of... So at that point, it. are you just adjusting the attack time? I don't even adjust attack time. I just add a little bit of... A little a bit of belly. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's okay. I, I might do a little bit on the attack. I, I've kind of refined my, my method of my madness, but literally for Tom's, it's set the pans, which on this last album, I'm, I'm taking you and I'm, I'm spreading you out through the soundscape a good bit, right? Sure. Uh, and, and then obviously a little bit of verb, but most of that transient master, because you have good sounding toms with, with the way you've mic'd them, it was really easy for me to do that. Well, and I remember when SPL first came out with this thing called the transient designer, and everybody was using them on snares and kicks and yeah. toms and all that stuff. And again, being a drummer myself, I don't get a chance to use that because I'm behind the drum kit and I don't want to accidentally bake it to tape. And that's me. That's just how I work, right? I'm a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to that stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, you got a tool that works. 
you use it. And, yeah. and that's that's the point. That is that is the lesson to be learned there is you, you could – I've used the SPL transient design, Designer, I think right. is right. Mm-hmm. There's probably like, what, 50 different versions of that app or plugin that you can find out there in the wild. Sure. Find one that works for you and – Go with it, right? Learn that, master that, use that in your routine, in your workflow, and you don't have to master 50 different versions of that. Well, and that's another thing. Like, a lot of the students I've had over the years are like, well, Jim, you know, do I need the this and do I need that and blah, blah, this and that? And I said, no, no, no. Don't buy any plugins until you know you need something to get. If you're using Cubase or using Logic or Pro Tools or whatever your flavor of choice is, they have all the plugins you could use all day long. In fact, most of them have a great reverb, a great transient designer, or some kind of wave transformer. They have all these different things. Whether the the you know the interface, the GUI looks good or not, and is right. usable, that's a whole different story. Right. But they don't spend the money on sexy pictures. They don't. Yeah, right. and and good graphics and meters and all that. They don't do that. But you know, like with with Cubase and Nuendo. You could take that same plugin, and it's written in a way that if it's a mono track, it's mono. If it's stereo, it's stereo. If it's 5.1, it's 5.1. That thing morphs to whatever it needs to be and actually is a 5.1. Ch- like, it's crazy stuff. But you can't find that with plugins. Now, I personally have uh, Waves Mercury, so I don't know how many that is, like 200 plugins. Right. And then I have a decent amount of UAD stuff. Uh, in fact, back in the day, my, my whole UAD card was unlocked when they had like 16 or 20 plugins, but now they have like a hundred. And so it's like, it's, you know, and, and I showed you a list. I came by the other day and I yeah. had this, I had this Excel sheet list of like, here's my UAD plugins. Here's the ones I own. And here's the ones I don't. And here's my Waze Mercury. And there's no reason for me to buy this API EQ from UAD and pay 150 bucks when I already have the API over here. It's so much stuff I can't keep track of. And so what you find out, at the end of the day while you're mixing, is there's probably going to be about three to ten mainstays that is your tool to use and what you use on everything. And the rest of it, it's just there for some extraneous moment that you might need some. So the the verb stuff, I'm a Logic Pro X kind of guy, and I, I, I had been using Chroma Verb for many years, and there's a lot of knobs you can turn. That's their and, built-in version? Yeah, that okay. is. And there's a lot of not, it's a great interface. It's got some good displays to show you what kind of response you're getting in the spectrum uh, from the verb side. The one thing that I found myself gravitating to, though, is there are other plugins out there, uh, like Native Instruments ROM and some of the other ones, where they do multiple facets of all that flavoring that you do to a, a sound in several plugins, like a delay, a slapback, and then a verb. Whereas you've got some of these plugins that will do all of that in one plugin stop, right? Mm-hmm. And I found that to me that that's where my taste go to is in my stable of plugins that I'll always go to first is one of those where I don't have to worry about throwing a delay in there or something. Because one of the things that I've figured out with my amp setup and then using the uh, loops, the effects loop with the Kemper, <laughs> this is the bane of modern mixing compared to the old school folks who you talk to about, whereas I want to have some options, right, going to the box with my right. sound. If I bake in my delay and my verb in here, and then that gets tracked on the computer, I'm stuck, right? Right. Unless I'm obviously molting a DI in there, which I will sometimes do. I stopped doing that a while ago just because it's... Too many I, tracks. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know what I want. I'm just going to do it, and that'll be good enough. Um, but having the flexibility in the can to be able to start changing those things... Instead of having to have a separate delay and a separate verb and a separate, you know, take your pick, whatever other kind of effects you want on your sound, I can just take one plug-in and have all those knobs for me right there in front of me. And most importantly, you're familiar with what those knobs do. Use it enough to sure. understand what you're doing to the sound in the context of the larger mix to, to know where you're going to turn stuff. And to me, that 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 that's kind of where I've gone to with a lot of my stuff in my mix you know it's funny you mentioned that because my biggest gripe from going from an analog studio with a full console and a racks of processors and reverbs and things like that um when i switched over to a daw and i finally got rid of everything except my compressors and preamps but i got rid of all my reverb units all that kind of stuff 
is most of your plugins, you could get a delay, you could get a reverb, but there's no multi-effects. Yeah. And, I mean, not to gripe here, but it's like, I'm not the engineer down at, you know, Lexicon or DigiFX or whoever that knows how to do reverse this, that right. pans into this and flips it. Like, yeah, I could stack these things. It doesn't sound like the multi-effect plugin that I used to pull up on Patch 69 and turn it up badass and cool for a Wicked Guitar Solo or a Screamo Metal Rock Band breakdown or something that was really cool. And I used to have these units. They were little half-rack units. I don't remember what they were called, but it was a Sony, uh, Sony units, and I bought two of them. And those were my special sauce, you know, reverb units that I'd use for this stuff. And it's only recently talking to you that you're talking about the ROM and the native instruments. And uh, CLA just came out with this new thing called, I think, Epic. And Epic is this really cool thing where he has four separate types of delays and four separate reverbs, which are all modeled after, you know, like AMS and Lexicon or whatever he has in his, you know, main thing. Mm -hmm. But what's really cool about it is you could blend any of them in on the dry signal that's coming in. It's for one, one input, right? Mm -hmm. But you could also take a delay and put it specifically this one reverb. And now this reverb only gets this delay fed into it and not the dry original sound. Right. And so now, a few little clicks, you're creating all sorts of crazy delay effects and, you know, adjusting things. And it's like, that's what I need back in my mixing. Like... Plugins like that are going to allow me to go somewhere that I haven't been able to go. Again, being a commercial place, I don't have a lot of play with my food time. Right. I'm always on the clock or I'm always shipping out a product or I'm doing this or that where I don't have the time to do that. Now these things kind of help me kind of get some crazy sounds. So here's a tip for guitars because this is something that I actually spent, as you say, playing with my food. I probably did this for a better part of six to nine months. And that is when I finally got into this somewhat routine, if you will, of how I was integrating my amp through Ruin Mic, through the ADL 600, into the box, using my focus effects loop in the Kemper, what plugins I was going to use downstream. Uh, if, for example, go look at Steve Vai's setup. Search on YouTube. You can look at all the different rigs or all the different pedals and his, his setup that he's got there. And one of the key parts to his sound is he'll actually split his guitar signal through a stereo chorus into left and right, mm -hmm. right? And he'll alter the delay in the left ear versus the right ear to give that kind of, that, I don't know what you call it, uh, sure. you know, that Wally Vision kind of thing, right? Right. There's a single plug-in that you can use to take a mono guitar signal from an amp, my single ribbon amp I got in front of that mic in there, into my into my setup here, I can throw it through that that plugin. It will do that exact same signal path through that convoluted uh, pedal board that Steve Vai's got, right? And basically give you the same result with one single app into a stereo, sure, you know, multi delayed sound. Right? Sure, that's huge because Absolutely. I actually tried to take the amp and the Kemper and try and do that with delays in the Kemper through some convoluted signal path to come back to the computer uh, with those two different paths, which sounded like shit because right. what you're getting out of the amp does not sound like what you're getting out of the Kemper. Right. They both sound good, but the goodness of the tube sound that we talked about before, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. So having the ability to take that and now morph that into a stereo image, all of the lead guitars on my last album have that in there where it's this delayed left right left right ear thing where you actually get that sense of body in that sound you know from the the beginning i've always been very big into having that wide stereoscape in my sound that i produce right. these and the way i would do that was I, and you've seen this before when you, the first time i remember the first time we sat down when we we're i forget which album we were working on and i had two aux sends to bus 10 and 11 a little more hard pan left and right with a a, a a phase shift in one and a time, you know sample delay in each of them trying to achieve that that same kind of effect which sometimes worked and sometimes didn't <laughs> right. whereas now a plug-in like this i don't have to mess with that stuff sure, sure. it's just a simple one-stop shop i've got all the things i need so that worked really works well for me yeah so for me it was always like it sounds phasey sounds phasey you know and i just i couldn't i couldn't deal and also like you know 
when you were using the Kemper with the effects built in and it was going to tape, I'd be like, I can't control anything because it's baked in. Right. You know, and, and, and having those ability to have like dry signals and then do whatever you want afterwards, yeah. it makes a huge difference, you know. It does, but in some respects it kind of, like I said, it flies in the face of the old school OHs, make a decision, you know, mark it with a chalk line and cut it, go. That's, it. that's true, but you don't know what's coming with the other 50 other tracks you're going to track on top of it. For someone like me, is very important, right? I'm a soul. I, I mean, you look at a lot of these tracks that I have from this last album, I've got 80, 100 different kinds of, tra you know, different tracks, individual tracks that are contributing to the sound. That's me la That's me on all 100 tracks, right? Right. Uh, except for the drums. You're obviously doing the drums. I'm doing everything else. So... And that, using that argument, yes, I agree with you. I need to have the ability to take knobs and turn them after the fact because, you know, I'm on track 96. Back in track 15, I wasn't thinking about what was going to be on track 96. Yeah, and if you so have, I, you know, 60 tracks of guitars with too much reverb on them, right. you got soup. It's going to be a, yeah, it's going to be a swimming <laughs> mess. But I still force myself, excuse me, I still force myself to the mentality of make a decision and go with it. Sure. And then live with it. Sure. Make a smart decision, right? And that's the key is making the smart decision. Right. Which means don't throw a freaking guitar on there with a five second reverb tail <laughs> right. that you're going to have to live with for the rest of the mix. Right. Uh, but yes, I, I agree with having the flexibility. So we're at the end of part two. If you want to check out Eric's stuff, it's at guitarmusica.com. His latest album is Twilight's Cold, and he has a few other albums you could check out also. And for the next part, we're going to get into the trials and tribulations of the final Sonic palette for this album, uh, extending the low end and situations like that. So I hope you stay tuned for the third episode. Building on top of the first course, the Studio Edge Pro audio recording series called Studio Concepts, Gear, and the Physics of Sound, Jim Pavette's next course, Planning a Studio, demystifies the planning process and teaches you how to get your studio designed and built. You see how to define your goals, plan your budget, and zero in on your musical philosophy so that your new studio will be in sync with your vision. It will also teach you about acoustics including absorption, diffusion, NRC ratings, and room modes. Once you have these in place, the Constructing and Fine-Tuning Your Studio course teaches you how to construct your studio, including floating floors, walls, and ceilings, and how to balance your acoustic treatment to get proper sounding rooms. Power, grounding, and HVAC systems are also discussed. A guest appearance from renowned acoustician Gavin Haverstick discusses the final results of a control room tuning and why having your rooms tuned is important. In the case study Home Studio Edition course, you get to join Jim Pavette as he consults with the owner and the construction team as they all work together to build a home studio edition. Real interviews and consulting with the contractor and owner bring all the theory to life and reveal some trials and tribulations of building a studio. This five-star rated three-pack course is a necessity to having a properly built studio. Get it now at thestudioedge.com.